foreign exchange is what keeps the financial markets moving, then SWIFT is what oils the wheels of foreign exchange. It thus seems entirely appropriate that foreign exchange should feature at Cybos. The foreign exchange market is the largest in the world. About $6.6 .6 trillion is traded daily in around 180 currencies. London is the centre of the FX industry. So at Cybos this year, there was a day dedicated to topics such as the FX Global Code, an attempt to raise standards and improve processes. So last week, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, came up with a great quote. He said, not everything that's not illegal should be considered acceptable. And he said, tech companies need to focus on defining and living by the standards that they would like to see in regulation. Hard regulation could not solve the behavioural, ethical challenges in wholesale markets. Regulation is essential as a requisite for fair and effective markets, but it's not enough. You need something beyond that. The code really has three objectives. The first is to define good conduct for the industry. The second is to ensure the industry adopts the code. And the third, and very relevant to our theme today, is that the market will continue to evolve. And this is a big code, it's global. It needs to evolve with the market or it will soon become out of date. As well as um, stressing the behaviours that we expect from the sell side, actually it outlines some very important behaviours that should be expected of the buy side as well. Yeah. Traditionally, we've been very bad at waving the flag in the FX world. You know, you read the headlines, it's normally about bad things. Mm. I think at the minute, this is, is evidencing something that we're do, doing that is really, really relevant and really, really important. And I think mm. we're doing it well. We just don't seem to be waving the flag enough. The FX market depends on and generates huge amounts of data. Uh, how do I know I've got good data? How do I have confidence in the data that I'm, yeah. I'm ingesting and using and making you know, uh, investment decisions um, most, most often with other people's money? My perspective here is that it's a public good that's being provided here. One issue is if you just leave it in an uncoordinated way, um, that, that public good might not be delivered. Typically what you want to try and do is you want to augment different data sets. Something that I've been working on as a, as a case study is looking at trying to forecast the earnings per share of retailers. So there you might be able to use satellite imagery to count the number of cars. Uh, also looking at mobile phone tracking within stores. So the idea there is you have slightly different variables, but then potentially when you combine them, they can corroborate each other and potentially give you a better, better signal. The private sector would, would really see the benefits from, from that and, and, and thereby be willing to, to contribute. I think one of the challenges, though, with that, which is a, a great utopian vision, is um, that everyone wants more information, but they don't necessarily want that to be their information. <laughs> Um, that's, yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's one of the challenges, and, and there's good reasons for that. You know, if, if you're a sort of buy side firm and you've got a long position, you're trying to execute. You don't want that information leakage to go out to the wider market because that's going to that's going to cost you. In the end of the day, we need the data so that we can make better, more efficient decisions. There were debates on the impact of new technology on trading, liquidity, and corporate FX workflows. AI here is is here as a help. I don't think it necessarily takes over. I think it, it, it helps us. And so where we, where we see AI being particularly useful is, is maybe when you put it in a trader's hands and it maybe helps them get a slightly better execution, right. or you put it in a salesperson's hands and maybe they can uh, learn which is the best client to call. So maybe rather than making five phone calls, they can actually only make three phone calls. And that's the AI in the background that's kind of helping them narrow down that, that list of things to do. Execution brings in some way no value. So why having people dedicating time on execution when you can have a machine, the ERP, speaking to another machine? In some words, we basically replace manual execution by a machine that works uh, 24 hours a day, uh, and basically that makes uh, execution completely streamlined. Being able to make real-time or informed decisions on a dynamic basis with who you're trading with, um, what price you, sh you should be trading on. Best price doesn't always equal best execution, right? So, so there's a lot of opportunities as an execution venue to be able to build some of this logic into our platforms. For corporates to be able to provide scale, they need automated solutions that really let them streamline and let them do lots of smaller tickets. The seamless connectivity and APIs that are nowadays being uh, available allowing us to get in much more collaborative partnerships with either banks, trading platform providers, fintechs, whatever, in order to optimize um, that process of FX management. And this is typically what drives the innovation level. Another hot topic during this FX day was the renminbi currency and how the RMB will evolve in the coming years. If they sign a deal with the, with, with the US, with, with China, actually 
the renminbi will become a more stable currency. Because if I asked you, is the renminbi cyclical, structural, or political, once they've signed a deal, it will become more political. And I think volatility in the renminbi will actually go down. Volatility in FX markets is already very low, but I think it would go down further. When Osborne was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, there was a lot of reaching out to China. I think it's fair to say that in, the, in London, the word renminbi is an opportunity. The word renminbi in New York is a threat. The faster the capital markets opens in China, the faster uh, the internationalization uh, of the RMB is going to achieve. We all knew that it would take time for those markets to open up, and um, that's still very, very nascent. So there's a huge opportunity for, for renminbi growth. We all, we all know it's going to be the next euro dollar. Um, it's just a question of what the path looks like exactly and, and how long it takes to tread. Specifically around timelines, I remember the, the mayor of Shanghai saying that Shanghai was going to be a global foreign exchange city by 2020. Uh, and that was a couple of, two years ago. I remember thinking, that's a pretty short timeline to, to try and pull that thing off. But as we I think learnt with the, with the Olympics in China, something can happen almost overnight actually in terms of them deciding to, that they're going to do something. Uh, and yet in that most recent survey, they moved from I think it's 13th, 13th to 8th. To eighth. Yeah, lucky number, big leap forward. Um, perhaps he's right, perhaps by 2020, Shanghai itself is a major FX centre. We see huge um, potential opportunities on the horizon to further develop the currency and further develop the CNH market. With over 30 top industry speakers, this FX Day was an insightful and well-appreciated event, one to be repeated.